Please welcome Vice President, Databases and Migration Services, AWS, Jeff Carter. Good afternoon. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and share some of the work that the teams have been doing. And let me just start by thanking the development teams who are watching in. Uh, we, they have been working very hard throughout the year to produce some of the features that we're going to be talking about, and I'm just super appreciative of the work that they have done. I'd also like to take a second to thank all of the people who are here in the room. Our customers are what makes this, and if you like what you see today, that's fantastic. If you're not seeing what you want, I really encourage you to talk to us and let's talk about it, because we're here to help make things better, and we would really like to work with you and hear what you have to say about that. So let's start with the big picture. When we think about data in AWS's approach to data, our vision is to help you manage all your data. And with that, not only are we talking about the data that you might have on-prem, the data that you might have in one or more different clouds, or the data that you might have at a third party, we would like to help you with cataloging and governing all of that data and breaking down historic silos. One of the key things that we do is we want to make sure we meet our customers where they are. And what I mean by that is if you take a look at the people that I'm talking to and people like here in this room, what we see is that from an application perspective, companies and enterprises are in a wide variety of states in their software. You may still have monolithic applications, client server applications, three-tier applications. You may have been started to use microservices. All of those things we need to be, have in our portfolio, and we do have in our portfolio, so that we can intersect with where you are today. We also want to make sure that we understand what direction you're going. And so when we talk to people about why they are interested in AWS and interested in the cloud, we hear also a range of answers. It could be things like we have an aging server that we want to replace or a failing server that we want to replace. It could be that we want to deprecate or get out of a data center or we may want to be building an application for 100 million simultaneous users. And all of these use different approaches, and within the AWS portfolio, we can meet the needs of all of these different techniques and approaches. So our strategy is to have the right tool for the job, both relational and non-relational databases. The other thing that we see is that when we talk to customers, and if we talk to our top 1,000 customers within AWS, 94% of the top 1,000 customers are using 10 or more database and analytic services. And so they see the value in the portfolio that we have. Now again, looking at a very high level in the big picture, when we talk about databases and what we're going to focus in on today in this presentation are the things that are primarily on the left-hand side of this chart. And what I want to do is tie together what we have been doing in the database space but then tie that, and if you were able to catch either of the earlier presentations today with Swami, who looks at all of this, or with uh, Broughton, who was talking about machine learning earlier today, or with G2, who gave the prior presentation in terms of analytics, this covers all of those spaces. But today, I'm going to be focused in on here what's called the transactional level, the leftmost side of this. Um, here it's represented by Amazon Aurora and Amazon DynamoDB, but on the next chart I'll show you a much larger portfolio. These systems are your systems of record, the transaction processing engines, OLTP, they go by a bunch of different names. But all of them are basically where data is created and used, and then typically for analytics you're going to want to migrate that data to the right on this chart. And so typically from the transaction processing systems, you would go to a data warehouse, something like Amazon Redshift, or a data lake, something like Amazon S3 or lake formation. And then from there, you would build higher level abstractions of the data, typically through some form of ETL process, where you might use a service like AWS Glue. And then it would go into an engine, perhaps Amazon Redshift or EMR. Redshift would be more the SQL-based solution, and EMR, perhaps you're using Spark or Hive. And down at the bottom of this, um, uh, uh, this chart, you might be doing things like machine learning with, with SageMaker or using a business intelligence tool like QuickSight. Now we all know in reality, the graph that you will have for your enterprise is much more complex than this. And there's going to be arrows going every direction. But at the macro level, the data is typically created on the left-hand side and migrates to the right-hand side for different forms of processing. 
Today we're going to be talking about the relational and the non-relational databases. So in the relational space, we have Amazon RDS, and within the RDS brand, we have five different services, two commercial and three open source. We also have Amazon Aurora, which is also Postgres and MySQL, so these are open source databases, but we have enhanced them in particular for performance, durability, and availability. With Amazon Aurora, you get six copies of the data in three different availability zones completely automatically. Aurora gives 5x the performance of standard MySQL and 3x the performance for Postgres at one-tenth the cost of enterprise-grade commercial databases. And we have hundreds of thousands of customers using Aurora. On the right-hand side, we have our non-relational products and services. And there's a wide range here, but if you need a key value store, a document store, if you need a graph database, in memory with something like um, ElastiCache, uh, we have all, whole, um, all of these different services that are available for you in your applications. In the prior presentation, G2 went into all of these together. I'm just gonna quickly show you this chart that says from an analytics perspective, we also have a wide variety of services and approaches that you may want to use to do your analytics. And we do have the broadest and most complete set of ML in the industry. Everything from building ML models with SageMaker and doing continuous integration and deployment of those models to doing more advanced analytics on things like text, speech, and vision using machine learning. Now, one thing that I always like to do is take a second and reflect on what we talked about last year and how it's entered the marketplace. So this is a combination of features that you would have seen at reInvent last year be announced, as well as things that we have released throughout the year. The first one I wanted to talk about is RDS Multi-AZ with two readable stand standbys. And this is released, released in March. It improves performance, it improves availability, and upgradability in the RDS solution. This is both Postgres, MariaDB, and MySQL. And so with this, you get three availability zones. You get local storage for logs, so it's very performant for the local writes. And it gives you options on upgradability where you can take down one of the instance and still have redundancy in your solution during upgrades. That has been very successful, but it pales in comparison to the success that we've seen with Amazon Aurora serverless version two. Aurora has been the fastest growing service in AWS history. And Aurora serverless version two is the fastest growing feature on top of that fastest growing database. And we see customers getting up to 90% savings with Aurora serverless v2. Now if you're not familiar with our definition of serverless, in the database space what we're talking about is typically when you picked a relational database, you would have to specify an instance and you would specify the number of cores, how much memory, uh, how much storage, and so on. With serverless, you don't have to specify that. You just say, I want a serverless instance, and when you do that, we are going to give you one, and we're going to adjust the number of CPUs and memory on the fly based on your actual workload. So if your system is very busy, we are going to scale it up in real time, and if on the weekend or at some other period it's not being used, we're going to automatically scale it down, and you save the money when it's not being used. Companies like Liberty Mutual and SMP Global are using Aurora Serverless. They like the simplicity of their operations and not having to specify the detail of the server characteristics, and they're finding it to be a very frugal solution for their environment. Now, in addition to those two launches, let me quickly hit on four additional ones. The first one I wanted to touch on is Amazon DynamoDB. This is our key value store, and one of the things that we have done is allow you to do now bulk imports from S3. So imagine in your application, um, you want to do a recommendation, next recommendation for your customers. And so you run a machine learning algorithm, you produce the data for all of your customers, and you save that file in S3. Now you can basically blink that data set into DynamoDB using this feature with absolutely no code and very performant. And then your applications and your web servers would be able to seamlessly access that data as it sits in DynamoDB. With Amazon Neptune, one of the features that we added was the global database. And we're gonna talk about this more later, but this is the sixth product that we've had in the global database perspective. And global databases allow you to create 
create read replicas in other regions that you can use for both performance and availability. We also added Amazon serverless, Neptune serverless, which brings to graph databases the same capabilities that I described with Aurora serverless v2. And the last thing on this chart is, um, uh, is the memory DB for Redis with data tiering. And what this does, it is allows you to take an in-memory database, but add a little bit of NV, NVMe local storage. And while you do that, you're going to give up a tiny bit of performance when you access the data off of NVMe as opposed to being in memory, but it's typically a millisecond or less. But you will be able to quadruple the size of data that you put on that in-memory compute node. And that will allow you to reduce the number of nodes that you have in an average solution by a factor of four. So it's lowering costs by having more data per instance. I encourage you to go and learn more about all of these in the time that you're here during reInvent and uh, in the coming time. Now let's take a sec and talk a little bit about some of the patterns that we see broadly across the industry. If I had been here 10 years ago, I would have showed you a chart that was a standard part of all of my decks that shows the rate of growth of data is growing um, asymptotically. It's basically, it's a hockey stick curve. And it's for growth from sensors, it's growth from social media, um, it's growth from a whole bunch of different factors that is causing just radical increases in the amount of data. IDC has said that 90% of the data today was created in the last two years. And it's growing faster than ever and I'm sure it's giving all of you fits in trying to manage it and get value from it. What we see is a pattern where many organizations have yet to realize the true value for the, all of the data that they are collecting. And with the world of highly distributed processing that we have, it's becoming even harder. And one of the things that we're gonna talk about is data gravity. And so let me take a moment and let's define data gravity. How does this come about? Well, let's start with an application. And your application is gonna gather some data. And you might put it in a transactional engine or you might put it in your data lake. But when you have that data, another application is gonna come along and say, I want to use that data. And then it's gonna add some more data to it. And then another application will come along and say, I need the data from those two things. And it's going to add its third data set. And this is going to spiral and continue to go until you get these incredible sums of data that are going on. And I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about and the data gravity pulls your applications and your services towards the data. We believe that we can help you get better outcomes by managing and overcoming data gravity. The first thing that we'll talk about is how we can use the right tool for the right job in our purpose-built databases to give you the scale and performance that you need to help with this. We're also gonna talk about geographically how we can optimize data location to help with things like giving fast response times to your end users, even if they are in a different region of the world. And we're going to help you with when you need it, because chances are you need real-time applications, both in the transactional space and in the analytics space. And another aspect of when you need it is you always need it. You need it with durability and resilience. So let's first talk about purpose-built. And so what we want to have is services that are a natural fit for the data and the application that you're looking for. And we want to have the right database for each workload. And let me give you a quick example. This is a simple phone app that would allow you to go shopping and perhaps buy a television. It would be possible to build this app on a single database, and many people have done it. But what they find is as their business grows, they're continually rewriting that application to deal with the additional scale. You can avoid that. And one of the ways to avoid that is to use some of these purpose-built databases. So let me give you some examples here. First, the search bar. You can use an indexed optimized store like OpenSearch to be able to handle that. You can use a key value database for your customer feedback, your five-star rating system and the feedback from other customers. You should use a relational database for the purchase button. You want to have the transactional integrity both for inventory and for the financial accounting. And you can use things like a graph database, Neptune, as an example, to do nearest neighbor and see what other things an end user might want to buy if they're purchasing, in this case, a TV. 
these are how modern apps are built using these different technologies all simultaneously within the same database to give people the size and scale that they are looking for and allow you to write the application once and have it scale to literally any size. Another thing is let's talk about high performance at scale. And so we want to be able to optimize that performance and scalability based on special workloads. And one of the features I would like to introduce today is Amazon DocumentDB Elastic Clusters. Now, DocumentDB is our fully managed native JSON database. And increasingly, people are finding this a great way to write applications, where they can just take, instead of doing a row and an insert, they're basically taking a JSON document and inserting that JSON document. And this is one of our fastest growing databases in the Amazon portfolio. What we've done and what we are adding is scalable write, effectively sharding um, automatically inside the database to be, allow you to scale the right activities beyond a single node. So it's always very painful when you run to the limit of an instance, in particular on something like on write workloads, and then in your application level have to do that sharding. Uh, that can be very painful and expensive to write. You will no longer need to do that because we're doing it inside the database. For a long time, we've been able to scale reads horizontally with this technology, um, but the key difference here is we are now scaling the right activities as well. And we're able to reach um, uh, basically millions of read and writes per second and petabytes of storage with this new solution. So with this, we are going to take your application you're going to pick a key, and we are going to use that key to distribute the data amongst multiple storage engines, and you can scale those storage en engines up and down based on your workloads. And we have some optimizations that when you're expanding, we can do things like, if it makes sense and it's the, the best thing to do, we will replicate the existing database to all of the new nodes and then delete the records, um, which is a very high performance activity uh, as a way to do the scaling very, very quickly. And another key thing about this is with alternative technologies, there are expensive licensing that goes with capabilities like that, and we're not doing that. A couple more features in the database space. One, and this is for RDS MySQL, is we're gonna talk about optimized writes first, and then we'll talk about optimized reads. With optimized writes, what we are doing is building on some technology that was developed in another part of AWS and it's giving us 2x the right throughput for an RDS MySQL database. Now, how are we doing that? So what we're doing is if you look on the left-hand side, MySQL happens to use a 16 kilobyte block size, but the hardware underneath is actually reading and writing in four kilobyte blocks. And so when you write a block with MySQL, what it had to do was because it was doing four discrete operations underneath, it had to write the data twice the first time to get the four discrete items written to a temporary location, and then it would go and it would update the actual data within the database. That was an availability feature because if those four writes got interrupted for any reason, you would end up with something in the industry known as a torn write and it could corrupt your data. And so always you would write it twice. With the Nitro-based instances within AWS, they have a new capability that allows you to do an atomic 16K write. So we're leveraging that and we have reprogrammed uh, MySQL to be able to leverage that, which means we with no risk of torn writes or no risk of data corruption, we are able to do an individual I.O. and not avoid the double write buffer. And it's done in a single atomic operation. Excuse me. The other thing I wanted to introduce Similar is optimized reads for RDS MySQL. And here what we're doing is adding local storage into one of the RDS uh, MySQL instances. And that local storage won't be used for your data persistence, but it can be used for things like temporary tables and intermediate results for things like um, sorts and um, aggregations. And by putting the, the data on the local thing, we get much better performance. And so for queries that are able to use this, you will see up to 50% faster queries. And this is available on both Intel and Graviton instances. Next up, what I would like to do is introduce a customer. And so I would like to welcome to the stage Nandu Ramani. He is from Intuit, and he's going to share with you about his journey with AWS. 
But first, we're going to play a video to introduce you to Intuit. Hello, inventors. I'm Nandu Ramani. I lead engineering for QuickBooks Online at Intuit. At Intuit, our mission is to power prosperity around the world. And from a strategy perspective, we're building an AI-driven expert platform that gives our customer more money in their pockets. I don't need to talk to you in Vegas about making more money, right? But they also, we also focus on getting people more time back which is very important for small businesses, and also getting them confidence in their financial decision. And let's dive into QuickBooks in the small business and self-employed space. These solve the largest problems our customers face. And we do this at massive scale, millions of customers, and we're seeing tremendous growth. Getting customers, get paid, access to capital, which might be hard during these times, paying workers, accessing advice from experts, being compliant and getting your books in order. QuickBooks is evolving from being a bookkeeping solution to a connected ecosystem that solves all the customer problems small businesses face. And this rocket ship is really taking off. You all know this favorite emoji. And what do you need to take off? You need to defy gravity. What does gravity mean for us? Our databases have grown over time, from gigabytes to terabytes to petabyte, as Jeff talked about. We keep adding to the same thing over decades. And one size does not fit all for the varied experiences our customers need. From my experience, monolith database and the data gravity that comes with it hinders our ability to scale efficiently, speed to market is hindered, and we are not able to innovate faster. Operating at petabyte scale, efficiency really matters. We have to overcome challenges with peak provisioning. Disaster recovery is non-trivial either. And when you have really complex schemas that are built over time, Right? I have multiple pages in my office trying to even take part of the schema. Difficult to understand. Hundreds of developers making changes. It's really slow. And our customers need data for real-time decisioning, automation, and insights. This is hard using legacy databases. So how did you defy gravity? We, using the purpose-built databases that Jeff talked about, while reinventing our architecture. Let me walk you through our journey. Every, many of you have this issue of monolithic databases or monolithic systems. Ours have grown over time, as we said. And bigger the mass, bigger the gravity. It is hard to break things. But there's also people gravity. People complain about the monoliths. That's what they know. 
they're used to it. A lot of failed attempts has cars. It's hard for management, even the team, to trust that this time it will work. And when you do large-scale rewrites, you have to have a lot of coordination tax. And the business is not willing to wait for three, five years. So my strategy has been to pivot to focusing on accelerating the business in a defined time frame, like one year, not three to five years. And the way we do it is we start breaking out the data incrementally. So we define domain schemas for domains like invoicing, accounting, expenses, extracted from our monolithic databases using change data capture, and publish on a Kafka bus. And once you free the data, now you can have your microservice, like accounting microservice, focus on the new innovation you want to deliver to your customers. You don't need to worry about all the things that's in the legacy system and trying to do it all at the same time. This is power to me. And now, this means I don't need to worry about the monolith anymore, right? A big learning for us is allowing it to peacefully coexist with the target state architecture. And what I also have to do is I have to collate all these data back again for some list and search use cases still. But that's easy to do. Also need to take care of replication. And eventually, this huge monolith that I was scared about has become my friend. And finally, I hope it goes away soon. It's going to be irrelevant. We're going to go to the nirvana of having microservices with purpose-built databases, all loosely connected, why are you inventing? And once you have this freedom, I can use the best fit databases for any of, for application. Let me walk you through a couple of examples. Our core of bookkeeping has, gets billions of trans, hundreds of billions of transactions every year. And we use key spaces for that. We love that the storage and compute is decoupled. So as my storage keeps increasing, I don't need to pay for additional compute. And then our secret sauce of accounting automation kicks in. Matching, a bunch of rules, AI models, and the feature store. We use DynamoDB for that. And for our core ledger, where asset properties are very important, we use Aurora. At petabyte scale, we love the cluster architecture. It simplifies peak provisioning. When the replica, right replica fails, it's easy to switch over to. And from a user experience perspective, to handle the billions of search and list events, we love open search, and we optimize read performance using Elastic Cache. Jeff talked about document DB. We love document DB for our complex schemas in crypto and commerce world. And finally, we are seeing tremendous acceleration and our KPIs are doing very well. Our customers are seeing all these benefits. We are seeing, our customers are seeing 60% improved page loads on a smaller database. They are seeing Innovations shipped daily. They are getting insights on their fingertips much faster. This is really important for small businesses. They have to make quick decisions. We are also being able to ship a lot of innovation. Our accounting automation rate, which is crucial for us, has increased by 250%. This is what we mean by giving our customers more time and complete confidence in their financial decisions. And all this couldn't have been done without us leveraging AWS purpose-built databases. So I want to give a huge shout out to the AWS team, and thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Nendu. Really appreciate you coming out here and sharing the Intuit story. Um, you just, it's very hard to get up here on these stages and present and for a customer to sign up to do this. I just, I can't be more appreciative. So thank you very much. 
All right, we're gonna continue on. We talked a little bit about how we're going to overcome data gravity, but let's also talk about where and when and some of the techniques that are used. One thing that we will touch on is the global distribution of data, and then we'll get into the streaming aspect of it. On global distribution, one of the things that many of our services do is allow you to create regional read replicas. This is really important because if you have an application that is meant to span the globe or different regions of the world, the speed of light becomes an issue and you can't have all of your data in one spot because if you're a person who's in India and you're accessing data in the United States, you're not gonna get the phone response, or the response time on the phone that you're looking for. And so it's important that we are able to replicate these data sets using these globally distributed read replicas to be able to create multiple copies throughout the world. That way, if you're in India, you are able to use a local copy for that data set and get the performance that you're looking for in the region that you're in. The other thing is when you create these read replicas, you're distributing the workload to other parts. And so even though these are read replicas, you are taking write or workload off of the, the instance that is doing the writing, and that's freeing it up and giving it more write bandwidth. And so you're spreading the load. The other reason that you might use this technique is it's a form of global disaster recovery. If something were to happen and you were to lose access to your primary database, you can very easily promote one of these read replicas to become the primary and continue operations across the globe. DynamoDB takes this concept one step further. And it not only allows you to create read replicas, but you can create read-write replicas. And so using this, you can create an application at global scale with both scaling reads and writes horizontally and providing single-digit millisecond latency for all of your workloads. This is an asynchronous uh, technique uh, for doing this, this particular replication, but with this you can do active, active, active uh, in this, as in this particular example. Now with DynamoDB, this key value store, one of the things that we see is customers working at absolutely massive scale, and this is true of our other um, um, non-relational products as well. And just to kind of give you an example, on Prime Day with Amazon.com, that happened in July of this year, DynamoDB was able to achieve 105 million transactions per second. And in the time of Prime Day, did trillions of API calls, all with single digit millisecond latency. So if you're looking for some of the secret sauce that runs Amazon.com, you have access to it with DynamoDB. We also wanna to talk today about overcoming gravity by helping um, share resources across different types of databases. And so many of our customers want to take data from one of the, the technologies and be able to transparently read it in another. And today we're announcing something that will be a prototype for the future, but we are announcing Amazon Zero ETL integration between Aurora and Redshift. Aurora and Redshift are two of our premier properties and we are connecting them together and with simply giving us a table name we will be able to replicate in real time data off of the Aurora system and get it into the Redshift system. And so with this, as rows are inserted, updated, and deleted within Aurora storage, those rows will be automatically reflected into Redshift, giving you the full power of the MPP analytics engine on the data in real time. So we'll also be able to do things like have multiple Aurora instances being able to write into Redshift a single Redshift storage. So imagine if you had a sharded database that was doing inventory across lots of different fulfillment centers, you would be able to have each of those fulfillment centers writing into a single Redshift instance, giving you a global view of inventory across all of your fulfillment centers. In addition to what we're doing with Zero ETL, we have many other approaches that we can use across all of our different services. So all of our services have different forms of change data capture, and we can use tools like Amazon uh, AWS DMS and Amazon Glue to be able to read those change data capture streams. We can do ETL using things like MSK, Kinesis, and Glue, and we can take the output of those streams and feed it to many different properties. And this is a, a standard technique that people are using across AWS services. Now let me pause again, and our next customer is Disney, and they're going to talk about their journey, and they're going to be on video today. So let me introduce Alex and Mark 
from the Disney team. It's unlike anything else. Follow me. The treasure map. Oh my god. A land filled with adventure. This is epic. I love this place. It's wicked good. Hi everyone, I'm Alec Jarsky, SVP of Data Software Engineering at Disney Streaming. I'm here with my colleague Mark Seneth, our Head of Core Data Engineering, to talk you through some of the challenges we have worked through with the help of our AWS partners. Everything we do at Disney Streaming, we execute at scale. We're ingesting, enriching, and storing vast quantities of data from an assortment of sources and processing them into a variety of data solutions used by our content product finance and marketing teams. We also interact with many segments across the Walt Disney Company that are autonomously spawning their own operational and analytical data sets. Each one operates in their own cloud habitat. Sharing data across the entire organization has been one of our big challenges. And typically, we've enabled that through point-to-point -point configurations. AWS has significantly improved point-to-point -point configurations in the past few years which has helped to reduce the technological barrier to delivering data from source systems into our data platform and from our data platform to destination sinks. Engineers can now focus more on developing core business logic, creating new data sets and delivering maximum value to our business. Sharing data point to point across a large organization comes with its own set of unique challenges. Governance, permissioning, and data discovery are complex when sharing data via these point-to-point -point integrations, especially at Disney's scale. Surfacing, governing, and applying permissions for our data sets is not a linear, but an exponential problem in an ever-expanding data environment. Figuring out how to defy data gravity and create a sustained ecosystem where teams can autonomously develop new data sets has been a crucial factor in cultivating innovation. Stitching together our environments in a maintainable way allows us to have our data when we want it, how we want it, and where we want it. In our data organization, we have standardized on S3 as our lowest common denominator, a pit stop for all our data sources. As feeds are ingested from various sources, enriched, cleaned, and aggregated for different use cases, S3 serves as our source of record. Many of our data pipelines consume and produce data sets from various AWS managed database services. We persist those data sets in S3, focusing on item potency and immutability, as well as registering in our centralized metastore for data discovery. Our distributed data mesh is the cohesive fabric that stitches together the different verticals and segments through a federated access layer. Although our data mesh is distributed in nature, we have abstracted out governance, auditing, permissioning, and data discovery capabilities into a centralized federated access layer, effectively creating a hub and spoke access model for our teams. This unified avenue of centralized federated access removes the data distribution burden from individual development teams, allowing them to focus on core business logic development. The centralized federation layer allows for seamless data set publication, breaking down barriers across all the accounts and enabling a consistent and agile data sharing approach. Further, we have found it critical to have a rock solid foundation of core data that can be relied upon across the organization, regardless of which team has built those data sets. We have created a focused technology team responsible for core services around this foundational data set something we call the green light for the business. It's imperative to have consistent reliability, observability, alerting, naming conventions, partitioning, data quality, and discoverability for our core foundational data sets. We're currently working on a plan to extend these best practice out of our core data teams into all of our vertical teams as well. We are expanding the consistency that is applied to our core data sets using DPaaS, Data Pipeline as a Service. Our vision is to leverage all the best practices that are invoked in our core data sets and extend them out to the rest of the data organization. 
making them available by default with little effort to individual data teams. Our plan is to achieve this by solid infrastructure deployment practices, wiring together different components through a configuration-based ecosystem. Teams should be able to create new pipelines and products with consistent observability, reliability, and data quality, with little to no effort. This will allow us to not only move faster, but also produce reliable data products. I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Mark, who will walk you through some of the specific technology choices we've made with AWS and walk you through two use cases where we've applied this model in our business. Thanks, Alec, and hello, everyone. Within the data organization at Disney Streaming, we utilize many different AWS managed services to help enable a variety of use cases. We ingest data from an array of online customer-facing operational systems cleaning, enriching, and generating insightful analytics. We take advantage of both Kinesis and MSK as our messaging buses, ingesting data into a variety of storage engines, such as Aurora, Redshift, and Neptune. Our streaming and at-rest data sets are both discoverable through our centralized Glue data catalog. Supporting services, such as MSK Connect, help to further remove the operational burden from our teams allowing them to focus their time and effort on domain-specific business logic. One example of how we have leveraged some of the AWS services we just talked about is the Year with Hulu site. The Year with Hulu site brought customers on a journey through the content they consumed on Hulu during the previous year. The site classified their viewing preferences and recommended new content they may enjoy. Our data science teams trained their models on top of our foundational data sets and then inferred classifications and recommendations. The final resting spot for this data was DynamoDB, which served as the backend database to power the site. The team was able to leverage the DynamoDB S3 export feature to export the entire Dynamo table to S3. This allowed us to leverage our big data MPP engines to fully validate the data in DynamoDB. The DynamoDB export functionality helped us get our data how, when, and where we wanted it, allowing us to meet our deadlines and launch the site on time. The second use case that I'll walk you through is our Insights Graph project. The Insights Graph system ingests data from multiple sources into MSK, our centralized messaging bus. We have multiple processing fleets hosted on ECS using Fargate that are used to clean, enrich, aggregate, and transform the incoming messages. The final resting spot for our Insights Graph is in AWS Neptune, although our generic graph formatted messages are also stored in S3. Our real-time consumers query the graph through an API hosted on ECS, secured with AWS Cognito and IAM. For offline analytical use cases, users are able to query the Neptune read-only replicas using SageMaker notebooks. We have designed the entire system with an immutability-first mindset, pushing the source of truth upstream of Neptune. Item potency allows us to add new syncs with ease and to replay history from any point in time. One of the largest problems we had to work through was seeding the graph with an enormous amount of data. Our initial efforts were to try to maintain a true Kappa architecture where we pushed all the historical data through the same pipeline we would be using for real time. We quickly realized that this would be infeasible as the amount of data we were trying to load into Neptune was many orders of magnitude larger than our daily capacity. It wouldn't be timely or economically feasible to process all the data through the same pipelines. We switched over to a Lambda architecture where we pre-calculated the entire state of the graph and then used the Neptune S3 loader functionality to seed the graph. The managed S3 loader handled the parallelism and locking challenges that we had been working through on the real-time side and allowed us to load our data in a cost-efficient, timely manner. To give you an idea of the scale of the Insights Graph, here are some pretty large numbers. On average, we are currently pushing 130,000 coalesce operations per second into Neptune. Our MSK deployment is handling 5 million requests per second. Each day, we are ingesting approximately 10 billion nodes and edges into Neptune. To reiterate what Alex said earlier, everything we do within the data organization at Disney Streaming, we plan to execute at scale. Utilizing AWS managed database services saves us time, allowing our engineers to focus on providing maximum value to the business. All right, back to you, Alec. Thanks, Mark. That was great. 
As you can see, AWS has taken the burden out of infrastructure management for us and enabled our teams to focus on core business logic. Back to you, Jeff. All right, thank you, Alec and Mark, for taking the time to film that video and share with us all of the great things that is being done at Disney. All right, very quickly, we have talked about four features so far, and we've got four more to go. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to take a little bit of a hard right turn. In the prior features, we were talking about things that made databases run faster and gave them new capabilities. In the rest of the presentation, we're gonna take a different turn, and we're gonna talk about features outside of the database that help with the manageability and the operations of those databases. So let's get started. But before we do, I wanted to make one point. Amazon, within AWS, we use a lot of open source. And we are very, very much working to give contributions to those open source communities. So across MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, and Redis, our teams have contributed and had accepted over 435 open source contributions during just 2022 year to date. And we have many more in the pipeline. And there's one in particular that I would like to share with you today. And this is something for Postgres, and it's being released both for RDS Postgres and for Aurora Postgres, and it's called Trusted Language Extensions. Developers love Postgres because it has a wide variety of extensions that you can put into the database to give it capabilities that it would not normally have and be able to process different forms of data. There's thousands of these extensions, but the mechanisms have been imperfect. For example, one user could have a problem in one of the extensions and affect other users on, on that particular system. And so we have wanted to invest in building a cleaner mechanism that is performant, that is safe, and that is manageable for adding extensions into Postgres. So what we have done is a builder can now build one of these extensions, and they can do it in one of six different languages, and we will be adding more. But those extensions will become code, and that code can then be deployed in a DBA, and only a DBA is able to, someone with DBA privileges is only, the only people able to install that on a Postgres instance. And then applications are able to take advantage of that. And again, our goal here is to have it be performant, have it be safe, and have it be manageable. Another announcement that we're making is in preview mode, and this is Amazon RDS, uh, guard duty for RDS. Security is a big deal. And what we're going to be doing with this feature is monitoring logon attempts to databases. And then we're going to take those, that information and in real time be running it through machine learning algorithms, looking for bad people trying to get into your database. The first thing in many database attacks that could lead to things like data exfiltration and other bad things that we don't want to have happen, the first step is logging into the database. So if we can affect it there and stop it there, we're saving and avoiding many different potential problems. So what we are doing here is we're taking these logon logs, and this will be focused on RDS Aurora first, and then we will expand it to the other RDS databases and beyond. But starting with RDS Aurora, we will be managing those, monitoring your instances, and feeding the data into guard duty. Now with guard duty, we can, uh, we can combine that information with other information that AWS security has, including is this logon coming from a known bad IP address? Because that's different than, for example, one of your end users just typing in their password wrong. And we wanna be able to make sure that we alert you for the one, but not alert you for the other because we don't wanna be sending you messages for every failed logon attempt. But if someone is doing something malicious, we do want you to be notified. In addition, by working with guard duty, we tie into all of the existing guard duty mechanisms. So things like event bridge for notifications, tying it into detective for being able to do research on what is going on, as well as security hub and the general guard duty capabilities. So it's very simple to configure. So you can do this across your account or you can do this on an individual instance with a single click. We're detecting in real time and giving you this information and we're giving you the context of what is going on so that you are able to determine whether or not this is something that needs to be investigated further. Another thing that we're announcing, and this is going to start with both RDS and Aurora MySQL, 
is something that we're calling Amazon RDS Blue-Green Deployments. Now, many of you in this room who are familiar with DevOps may be familiar with blue-green deployments, but it's probably not everybody. So let me start by just a quick example of what a blue-green deployment is. Your existing production system is the blue system. Now, if you would like to do one of these blue-green deployments, you're simply going to click on a button on the console, and we are going to go replicate your production environment with a brand new system including all of the data, and set up change data capture between the two systems, logical change data capture, to keep the two systems in sync. Once the two systems in, are in sync, you are able to go and modify the green system in any way that you would like. Typically, what you would do is do things that would normally require long outages, things like upgrading operating systems, upgrading database versions, both minor and major, or doing a schema change that on a large table might take several hours. All of that can be done on the green system while you're still running production with all of your customers on the blue system. You can also do all of your testing on the green system, and you can keep this in place for hours, days, or weeks, keeping them both running in parallel. When you are ready, you do a flip. And as fast as your applications can fail over from the blue environment to the green environment is the only downtime that you would have. Now, there are ways that we can make this go faster, but we're saying 30 seconds to a minute conservatively is what the expectation would be for the flip over time. And we have many very skilled database engineers within Amazon, and they have worked with us on this to do some very advanced techniques, including things like blocking the writes on the blue system immediately preceding the flip over. We will also be monitoring and uh, doing performance health checks on both systems and doing things like looking for long-running queries between both systems and making decisions about whether the right thing is to stay on the blue or go to the green. And all of this is basically available to you. The thing I like about this feature is it's taking a technique that the most advanced DevOps teams in the world use and we're making it available for everyone and making it easy enough to use for everybody to be able to use it. The last feature I wanted to talk about is in the data great database migration space. And this has kind of become a standard slide um, in, in these presentations. But the number keeps changing. And so to date, using our database migration services, we have migrated over 800,000 databases. This includes both true migrations from, say, an on-prem um, uh, 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 vendor system to one of the, the different properties inside AWS. It also includes people who are trying to populate their data lake, both from on-prem and from within inside AWS. But each is a unique table uh, source target combination um, in, in a long running, running window. Data migration services offers a lot of compatibility, both in terms of source systems and in target systems. And so we're constantly expanding the ones that we're supporting, but these are the ones that we have available today. And what we're announcing today is something where we have had for some time a schema conversion tool, which was a PC-based tool that allowed you to look at the source system, whatever the technology, and the, and the target technology, and it would help you do the schema conversion, and it would also help you convert queries from, from the source to the target. And what we're doing here is we'll continue to offer the PC-based system, but we're turning this into a true AWS service and that will allow us to do even further automations in the, in the future. But the goodness that you have seen with the schema conversion tool will now be in the cloud and available for, for further automation. So again, what is happening here is we're treating this as database schemas and code objects. We're doing the conversions and then we're applying it to the, the new systems. And basically providing an end-to-end -end data migration solution. So in this presentation, We've talked a lot about data gravity and some different techniques that we have to overcome the data gravity, both in terms of how you would do it, where you would do it, and when you would do it. And we have the technology today, we're doing this at scale, and we're helping build some of the biggest applications in the world. And you saw it today with companies like Intuit and Disney and the things that they're doing within AWS. And so we know that we can do any size, and we can start small, and we're perfectly happy doing small databases, but we can also go up to some of the most demanding applications in the world. And the point I want to get across to all of you is this is something that you can do. 
If you're sitting outside of AWS and you're saying, can I get into AWS? Can I do this and can I do these, these migrations and are the technologies there that I can run successfully? I guarantee you the answer is yes. I happen to have the opportunity to lead some of the Amazon.com teams that moved completely off of the legacy vendor systems and moved everything into AWS. And so we absolutely can do this. So I just wanted to say thank you for coming. We're ready to help. Cheers.